Ladies and gentlemen, we now have the absolute honour of our keynote speaker, Professor Andrew Channon. Now, many of you will be familiar with Andrew, but if you're not familiar with Andrew, Andrew is the Director of Clinical Services at Origin Youth Health Clinical Programs in Melbourne. He's the Deputy Research Director of um, Origin Health Research Centre and Centre for Youth Mental Health. And he's just an, an absolute subject matter expert in this field. And we are all very, very privileged to be listening to Andrew. So can I get you to welcome, please, Professor Andrew Channon. Thank you, Dee, and uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'd like to uh, pay particular tribute to Jan McMahon to, uh, for uh, organising the um, conference. I do this every time I get up here, but uh, uh, Jan really has been a, a fantastic advocate for this work. Uh, thank you to Paul as well for inviting me, uh, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I think, uh, Penny, now that um, We've heard those inspiring words, and now that you're out of the Senate, I think you can let the intervention order lapse on us. So uh, I think uh, we can probably have more, uh, uh, less kind of uh, um, uh, urgent discussions and maybe more discussions about how we might work as a network and uh, uh, try to, to get change in this area. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, about change and about uh, what we know about borderline personality disorder and what, how we might think about doing things differently. Uh, it's not meant to be a talk about doom and gloom, but it is meant to highlight the extent of some of the problems and also to uh, have us think about how we might advocate. And I think one of the important things about this conference is that there are lots of carers and consumers here uh, who I think are the strongest voices for advocacy, the best voices for advocacy, and the best voices for change in this area. Uh, and I think that we need to think about what are we advocating for uh, in, uh, in services for borderline personality disorder. We were talking last night with uh, Penny about uh, it's not enough to uh, say things are bad, you also have to have a plan. Uh, and I think what we lack is a coherent plan across the sector as to what we might do, uh, how we might advocate for change. So I hope to provide some food for thought about what we might think about in terms of uh, what we advocate for. So what I want to talk about first of all is what we actually know about borderline personality disorder. What are, the, what are some of the important facts that might help us to think about how we advocate uh, for change? And one of the important facts is borderline personality disorder is a big problem in the mental health system whether people want to acknowledge it or not. One in five psychiatric patients has borderline personality disorder and despite all the efforts of uh, many uh, service systems around the world, not just in Australia, to avoid tackling the problem, uh, this patient group uh, is a help-seeking patient group. Now you have to wonder why in some instances people would keep turning up for help in a system that's so hostile toward them, but people are seeking help uh, and we need to gear our services not toward uh, uh, bunkering down and trying to avoid providing services, but actually toward meeting the needs of uh, people with, uh, with BPD. One of the other uh, facts that we now know is that borderline personality disorder is a unitary construct across the life course. That's just technical speak for it's the same thing at all ages. There's no such thing as adolescent borderline personality disorder or adult or old age borderline personality disorder. Just like asthma, which is asthma whether you have it in childhood or you have it in adolescence or adulthood, uh, it is the one disorder. And we need to stop using, I guess what I would call weasel words about the disorder, the kinds of things that soften uh, our um, uh, discussion of it by describing uh, uh, particularly adolescent or emerging borderline personality disorder, which is uh, my particular area of interest, uh, that there's nothing emerging about it. It is borderline personality disorder and we need to do something about it when it first appears uh, in an individual. 
We also need to acknowledge that borderline personality disorder is a legitimate differential diagnosis. That is uh, one of the things that we should be considering uh, among the many common disorders that occur in young people. In people with the whole range of common disorders in young people, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit disorder, substance use disorders, non-suicidal self-injury or deliberate self-harm, depending on how you, uh, uh, which side of the Atlantic you come from, uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, all of these uh, uh, problems uh, are actually uh, part of the same cluster of problems. Uh, and many, there's actually a slight error there, that should be a new dot point there, that many of these, as, uh, these disorders have what we call tray-like aspects. And we call them mental state disorders to give them a bit of civility uh, in, in young people. But actually, the roots of borderline personality disorder are present in many of these common mental disorders in young people, particularly the, the traits of impulsivity, affective instability, that is emotional instability, and hyperaggression. And that you can see the roots of these, uh, and I'm not suggesting in any way that all young people who have these diagnoses have the disorder, but when you see complex young people in particular who have many of these disorders, you need to be thinking, is this a personality disorder that I'm looking at, not just attention deficit disorder? If you think about disorders like attention deficit disorder, impulsivity is an important part of the disorder, and impulsivity is just a tray. It's a tray that has a natural history across the lifespan. Uh, and so we need to be thinking much more about these disorders as part of a, uh, a, a broader uh, cluster of psychopathology, of, of problems that people can have. Uh, and we need to be thinking about identifying personality pathology as early as we can in life and treating it as such. We also know that borderline personality disorder can be diagnosed in people under age 18. There's never been in any of the diagnostic manuals a statement that says you can't make the diagnosis in young people. It's a, a, a myth. If you go back and read the DSM or you read the ICD-10, uh, you'll see that they might express some caution. Nowhere do they say you cannot make the diagnosis. And more importantly, National guidelines now recommend making the diagnosis when it first appears. Now, uh, uh, it's not just the NHMRC guideline, uh, and it doesn't reflect just parochial Australian concerns. The NICE guideline in the UK was actually the first national guideline to recommend this. Uh, and if you have a look in the most recent edition of the DSM, uh, um, some of you will know that there was a big battle over the personality disorders section in the DSM. Uh, the section three, which is the model that um, uh, didn't get up at the last minute, uh, but that's the new model for the alternative model for personality disorder. Uh, doesn't mention anything about age. In fact, it's removed all restrictions uh, on diagnosis according to age, uh, all oral concerns. Uh, and the ICD 11, which is coming out probably in about 2017, uh, is uh, uh, almost certainly going to drop any mention of age in relation to personality disorder. The other important corollary of this is that not everything that happens in people under the age of 18 is early intervention. There's a lot of confusion about what that term means. Uh, and many of the young people that we see in our program, many people that you will see if you work in youth justice or you work in out-of-home care, are people with chronic and enduring problems already well before they're 18. And we need to be thinking about the problems that people face rather than uh, trying to uh, just think about it in, in chronological age uh, uh, terms. And I think this is really one of the critical issues that is unrecognised or under-recognised uh, in borderline personality disorder, that severe and persistent functional disability is an under-recognised and devastating hallmark of borderline personality disorder. There is now strong evidence to show that although the features of borderline personality disorder uh, have a particular history across the lifespan, they start rising at puberty, they peak in the teens and then they start to drop off every decade after uh, young adulthood, functional impairment is absolutely stable and that's why we think of personality disorder 
as a stable disorder. It's not a stable disorder. Personality disorder changes across the lifespan. Uh, and while that's good news, and there was a lot of uh, excitement uh, uh, in the earlier 2000s, uh, uh, last decade, about this change in our understanding of uh, the outcome for borderline personality disorder, what's also very clear is that the functional consequences of having borderline personality disorder are, are something that people live with uh, for decades. This is not something that gets better. And this is really the main game in the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Among 15 to 34 year olds, borderline personality disorder is actually the fourth leading cause of disability uh, in, uh, in females and the sixth in males. These are, this is a major and serious mental disorder that needs to be taken seriously. But still we face the challenge that in the most recent Global Burden of Disease survey, borderline personality disorder wasn't even measured. And if it's not measured, you don't have a seat at the table and therefore it's very hard to advocate, particularly uh, at a health policy and health service level uh, for change with regard to this disorder when you have the problem that uh, the politicians, particularly health service planners, look at uh, the global data and they go, well, borderline personality disorder isn't even in the list. Uh, and we need to have borderline personality disorder included in the next Global Burden of Disease uh, study. This is also a costly disorder, and I guess I have uh, uh, Penny's words in my, uh, ringing in my ears here, that this is one of the hooks, I think, for health, uh, uh, health policy planners and for politicians. Having any personality disorder is more strongly associated with receiving the disability pension than having anxiety or depression. And among the personality disorders, borderline personality disorder traits have the strongest positive association with receiving disability benefits. This is, a, I think, a really striking uh, point that should be worrying uh, uh, governments, particularly given the, the focus on the dis disability support pension at the moment uh, and the moves to try and move people with mental health problems off the disability support pension, many of those people have borderline personality disorder and are on there because of those functional uh, uh, disabilities that they have, uh, which I would argue are treatable but for which we haven't implemented a service response to, uh, uh, to treat them. And again, another really under-recognised problem is that Unemployment and borderline personality disorder are actually potentially lethal. That, uh, and this is a very interesting study looking at unemployed people who committed suicide. And if you compare them with uh, um, living unemployed control uh, uh, participants uh, in this study, uh, they were 22. The, the people who died by suicide were 22 times more likely to have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And if you ask people with borderline personality disorder what do they want, they'll tell you they actually want to work in the open labour market. They don't want uh, special jobs, they want proper jobs. Uh, and uh, in a review though of 11 longitudinal studies uh, of the employment outcomes for people with borderline personality disorder, uh, after a, a period of anywhere between one and 27 year follow-up, uh, about 45% remain unemployed. And among those who are unemployed, very, uh, sorry, who are employed, very few are actually genuinely self-supporting uh, and about 20 to 45 per cent are actually on disability benefits. This is a huge source of disability impairment and costs in the Australian community. We also know that most of the costs uh, uh, attributable to borderline personality disorder are attributable, attributable to what we call indirect costs. Uh, and they're chiefly work-related disability. And even the lowest estimate suggests that about 25% of the societal costs of borderline personality disorder is due to work disability. So again, the, the evidence is really quite striking. And the reason I put all those references there is to show you these are not just opinions. These are established uh, features of the scientific literature on borderline personality disorder. And vocational impairment is present early in the course of the disorder. And, and what we need to remember is that completing education and training and transitioning to employment 
uh, are normative experiences for emerging adults. They're an incredibly important develop, uh, developmental milestone. And these, the problems with making this transition are much more pronounced uh, in, in uh, uh, individuals with borderline personality disorder. And unemployment uh, uh, at a young age has scarring effects across the lifespan uh, and uh, leads to an increasing likelihood that people will not be employed in the future. And in young people, borderline personality disorder at age 14 predicts poor academic and occupational attainment two decades down the track. So those young people that we see with borderline features who are, uh, or, or borderline personality disorder, who uh, aren't diagnosed, whose problems aren't recognised, who receive substitute diagnoses of depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder, uh, who are already experiencing problems, who aren't receiving treatment uh, in child and adolescent mental health services, they are going to be part of the chronically unemployed and disabled that we see in the future. Another untold part of the disorder is the physical health consequences of having borderline personality disorder. That um, borderline personality disorder is associated with a range of physical health problems. Cardiovascular disease among younger adults and arthritis and gastrointestinal conditions among uh, uh, all ages. Uh, and there's now a series of um, uh, studies that have been published, some of them from my PhD student there, Shea Quirk, uh, but others internationally, uh, showing that, um, uh, that cardiovascular disease in particular uh, is uh, uh, associated with borderline personality disorder. Now, there are likely to be mediating factors uh, that are important. We know uh, among uh, our studies of young patients with BPD that, for example, the mean age of onset of smoking in uh, borderline personality disorder is 12 years of age. And uh, we just have some data we're about to publish comparing young people with borderline personality disorder with uh, their healthy peers in the community. The uh, uh, rate of daily tobacco use in the community among uh, young people is now down to about 12.8 per cent. And among our young borderline patients, it's 68 per cent. You can imagine if you start smoking at 12 and you've got a couple of decades of daily tobacco use under your belt by the time you're in your 30s, that you are headed towards significant cardiovascular disease. We also know that um, uh, even at mild levels, alcohol and drug use and uh, physical illness uh, and functional impairment are all predictors of mortality in people with severe personality disorder. And interestingly, the study by Marcella Fock was done of service users in the UK. So this is not people in the community, this is the people who turn up to see you in your clinical services for those clinicians who are, who are there, uh, who are here in the, in the audience today. We also know that, um, well sorry, actually one other fact that I uh, didn't mention there is that uh, people with uh, severe personality disorder also experience a shortfall in life expectancy of almost two decades as well. Now that's not that dissimilar to our indigenous population uh, in terms of the extent of the problem, uh, that you will lose uh, two decades of life uh, if you have a severe personality disorder. Another area of uh, neglect is distressing symptoms, that very often clinicians become dismissive or kind of uh, reductionistic in their thinking about severe symptoms in borderline personality disorder, attributing everything to, uh, to the disorder uh, and not thinking about conventional uh, treatment for the disorder, uh, for, the, for the problems that present within the disorder. And one that I want to highlight is actually auditory verbal hallucinations, that is hearing voices. That those of you who work with people with BPD and those of you who have BPD will know that voices are a very common part of the disorder. But this has been clinically contentious, people uh, often dismiss them, uh, and yet, um, and they were certainly believed in uh, days gone by to be uh, brief and less severe and qualitatively different from so-called true psychotic symptoms, uh, such as those that occur in schizophrenia. Uh, 
But actually, uh, there have been a number of studies, and this is really one of the hot topics in, uh, in BPD, a number of studies that have now shown that from a phenomenological point of view, you cannot distinguish between auditory verbal hallucinations in uh, borderline personality disorder and those in schizophrenia. And this is 50% of patients. This is not a small number of people who are experiencing these. And actually, commonly, they're not transient uh, uh, symptoms that, uh, as it's written in the DSM, these are commonly long-standing problems. And the mean age of onset for voices in BPD is actually earlier than that for schizophrenia, 16 years of age. And rather than being something that can be dismissed as a kind of an epiphenomenon of, of uh, borderline personality disorder, it's looking much more like this is a marker of severe borderline personality disorder and should be a focus of clinical attention. There's a wide assumption that uh, these uh, um, voices are actually unresponsive to antipsychotic medication. But actually, if you ask anybody who says that to produce the evidence, they won't be able to, because there's never been a randomised controlled trial of conventional treatment for voices in people with borderline personality disorder. Yet you'll find lots of clinicians who say with great authority that they don't respond uh, to antipsychotic medication. Now, it might be that antipsychotic medication is or isn't effective. We don't know. It might be that some of the psychological approaches to voice hearing uh, might also be uh, uh, effective uh, in people with borderline personality disorder, but no one has done a randomised controlled trial of any of the interventions for voice hearing in, uh, in BPD. Paradoxically, though, there is a, a high rate of prescribing of antipsychotics, particularly the second generation antipsychotics uh, in um, uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, and about one third of people with borderline personality disorder have been prescribed them. Uh, worse still though, polypharmacy, that is the, the uh, uh, co-prescription of multiple medications, uh, occurs in about 50% of patients, 50% of them taking three or more uh, medications at any one time. Now these are US data and we often think that we're uh, much better than the US uh, in Australia, but, uh, but actually the data aren't that dissimilar here, and I'm sure Satcha particularly can tell you some horror stories about patients who come to Spectrum uh, on, on uh, very lengthy uh, lists of medication. Uh, you know, it's a wonder they can stand up, let alone make it into Spectrum. So, uh, so we also see this in young people. We see people already just at the early stages of the disorder being prescribed uh, second generation antipsychotics for no apparent reason, aside from the fact that people think they'd like, they want to do something for them. Uh, and uh, this is not a kind of buy now and uh, pay later uh, strategy because actually if you're going to develop the metabolic complications of taking this, these medications, uh, the first signs of those actually appear within 12 weeks of starting the medication. This is not something you can do in the short term and say, well, someone will take them off them in the long term, I'm sure. And the treatment of auditory verbal hallucinations in, uh, in BPD uh, really uh, is, falls between the cracks, between guidelines and between clinical thinking, that actually there is a direct conflict between the guidelines for the treatment of psychosis uh, and those for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. That clinical practice guidelines for psychotic disorders emphasise early uh, and effective treatment of psychotic symptoms, emphasise the toxicity of psychotic symptoms as a uh, a stressful process in brain metabolism, and yet uh, guidelines for borderline personality disorder say don't prescribe them. Now, they say don't prescribe them for reasonably good reasons, that there's an absence of evidence about their effectiveness for the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Uh, but as I said, they're not, they're not talking about the treatment of auditory verbal hallucinations. And we really need proper evaluation of the risk-benefit ratio of prescribing these medications, of rejecting these medications, or of advocating for alternative <coughs> treatments like psychological interventions or some of the voice-hearing interventions that some of you will know about. Uh, but the bottom line is that borderline personality disordered patients uh, experience these symptoms as highly distressing. And I can't help but wonder whether we have that soft bigotry of low expectations that we expect less for the outcome for people with borderline personality disorder. Uh, 
I got ahead of myself here. This is where I was going to make my big point about reduction in life expectancy. <laughs> um, every time I give this talk at, uh, or give, speak at this conference, I've got off a plane from somewhere, so uh, I'm, I've got the same excuses uh, as Dee. I'm a little sleep deprived. Uh, but I think this is really one of those striking facts about borderline personality disorder that people need to know. There's this kind of myth that patients with borderline personality disorder are indestructible, that they just keep representing to emergency departments, uh, that they take overdoses. You know, you still hear stories in emergency departments of staff saying to patients, you're going to have to try harder to kill yourself, you know, that this is, uh, you know, that was a pretty weak effort and uh, if you really wanted to kill yourself, you would have done it by now. These kinds of really offensive statements that uh, uh, really ignore the very real fact of mortality from borderline personality disorder which is actually four times that of the general population. There are lots of figures that go around. There's, uh, there's one paper that uh, uh, goes around that says it's 50 times. That paper's actually incorrect, but it's been cited many times. If you go back to the original source for that paper, it doesn't actually have the data that they quote. Uh, but it is four times the general population. But among young people, it's actually 10 times uh, the, their uh, peers. And around about 8 to 10 per cent of people with borderline personality disorder will die by suicide. But that's not the only source of mortality in this patient group. Uh, and the seeds of morbidity and mortality are sown very early in the course of the disorder. This is something that we need to tackle at the first presentation of the disorder, not down the track when they have been through the mill uh, uh, many dozens, if not hundreds of times, uh, through emergency departments and uh, uh, inpatient units. So what do we know about treatment? Well, there is good news about treatment. We know that evidence-based treatments are more effective than treatment as usual. And you can see there a non-comprehensive list of the treatments available for uh, borderline personality disorder. Uh, most of them three-letter therapies, uh, except for STEPS, which is a six-letter therapy, so that means it's twice as good. And, um, uh, but they, uh, these, uh, all these therapies have been shown in uh, randomised controlled trials to be uh, effective treatments. One of the problems uh, we have in reading the literature on treatment for borderline personality disorder is that this really comes down to kind of um, uh, brand promotion activities, you know, selling different brands of soap powder. Uh, and uh, I think the biggest problem is that when comparing a treatment to treatment as usual, that actually treatment as usual is a very variable beast. And part of the reason that we're here is because treatment as usual is often maltreatment as usual. And comparing your treatment to bad treatment, if you've got a nice structured intervention that's respectful of patients, as all these are, uh, and that is organised and uh, effective, uh, then of course your treatment's going to be more effective uh, than bad treatment. Uh, and and it, it, interestingly, when you uh, particularly look at the trial of cognitive analytic therapy uh, in adults uh, with uh, personality disorder, uh, that actually the control treatment in that uh, uh, study, which uh, was um, treatment as usual in the NHS in the UK, the control uh, uh, condition got worse over the course of the treatment. So in fact, uh, treatment as usual can be what's called a nocebo, that is a placebo that harms people. So I think just as it's unacceptable now to do uh, treatment as usual uh, controls in, or, or placebo controls in depression or in psychosis for the uh, uh, treatment of um, for, for pharmacotherapy states, I think we should be saying now that treatment as usual is, uh, should now be ruled out as a, uh, a comparative treatment for randomised controlled trials of borderline personality disorder. Despite having a whole range of effective treatments, access to these treatments is actually very poor and dropout from these treatments is unacceptably high. And what we find is that, yes, you can set up your treatment service and, yes, you can cherry-pick the people who are motivated or who uh, uh, are able to access your treatment, but actually there's a whole lot of pe people uh, who, through these highly selective mechanisms for people to get into treatment, miss out on treatment and requiring uh, high levels of so-called motivation to access care rules out a lot of people from effective care. What we also know is, despite all their different theories and uh, uh, different techniques, 
that most of these uh, specialist treatments actually have the same effects. And when you compare these uh, specialist brand name treatments to generic treatments that are highly structured, that systematise high quality clinical care, that actually uh, structured uh, generalist interventions perform almost as well, if not as well, uh, as these specialised uh, interventions. So we developed good clinical care. Uh, um, Anthony Bateman and Peter Fonagy developed structured clinical management and John Gunderson developed general psychiatric management and these have all been used as comparison treatments for brand name psychotherapies uh, and come out looking pretty good. So, uh, and in fact if you read the latest uh, randomised controlled trial from Marsha Linehan, what was really interesting about that trial was that she replaced the individual therapy with uh, case management uh, and uh, in fact, there was, uh, she kept the groups, uh, but uh, in fact the case management plus DBT groups was just as effective as individual DBT plus DBT groups. And I think there's a really important message in there. Not that we shouldn't be doing DBT or we shouldn't be doing MBT or any of the other brand name psychotherapies, but that what we should be doing is high quality structured clinical care, which is much more achievable in healthcare systems than uh, these uh, highly specialised treatments that require very high levels of training. And it does raise the uh, interesting and intriguing question as to whether individual psychotherapy is in fact necessary for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Uh, we're conducting a study at the moment looking at that very question. Uh, I'm not convinced that we have to be chasing people around uh, to provide individual psychotherapy to be providing effective care for individuals with borderline personality disorder. And with regard to pharmacotherapy, although there's a lot of prescribing, uh, there really is this absence of evidence. And what we need to have is high quality trials uh, for people with borderline personality disorder, not give up at this stage. And I think one of the disservices that um, uh, some of my colleagues have done is to say that the game is over, uh, that there's enough evidence to say don't prescribe. I actually think if you look at the evidence, and in fact, uh, kind of um, off the stage, my colleagues uh, agree with me, but when they're on the stage they say a different thing, uh, that the, the quality of the evidence is very poor. Uh, and poor quality trials are not a substitute for, uh, for quality evidence. So we really need some high quality trials to rule in or rule out whether we're going to be pursuing this and have some definitive answers. So what can we do to uh, improve the effectiveness of treatments? We know that treatments are effective for borderline personality disorder, but when you read any of the trials in the literature, none has actually led to functional recovery for individuals with borderline personality disorder. And in particular, vocational recovery has not automatically followed from symptomatic recovery. Uh, and really, uh, I think the key change that we need to make in the treatment of borderline personality disorder is to change the primary focus from symptoms to behaviours, uh, uh, from symptoms of behaviours to functioning. We focus a lot on self-harm, and self-harm. Uh, and we focus a lot on hospital attendance. One of the early claims to fame for treatment of borderline personality disorder was that it stopped people turning up and using hospital beds. Now that's not something that, that, that patients will tell you they necessarily value uh, uh, over having a job or over having uh, uh, relationships that they value in the community. We often focus on things that are kind of inconvenient for clinicians or frightening to watch but things that often uh, patients won't nominate as their top priority for treatment. It's a really interesting study, that study, because it actually asks patients what they want, what they value in treatment. Uh, and uh, the most effective early intervention for uh, borderline personality disorder would actually be to prevent the establishment of long-term vocational disability. And we can learn a lot from the psychosis uh, literature about vocational recovery, about vocational interventions, and about the, the therapeutic value of work. That work leads to recovery. It's not that recovery needs to happen to lead to work. Now we need to look at that in borderline personality disorder, uh, 
but we need to be helping people with BPD to contribute in the way that they want uh, to working in the community. We also need to focus upon physical morbidity and premature mortality, smoking interventions, uh, weight uh, and diet, these kind of basic things that are way down the priority list for people with, uh, with borderline personality disorder when they come into clinical services. The focus is always on are they going to kill themselves or not, are they going to harm themselves or not, uh, and really not much else in fact. And we need to put the focus on their health and well-being and think about the longer, uh, longer game of uh, uh, health care and, uh, and providing comprehensive health care for uh, people with borderline personality disorder and prioritise smoking interventions and, and, and the, the like. But what we also need to do is stop making things harder for them, stop putting them on second generation antipsychotics that are associated with high levels of weight gain uh, and making, the, making life even harder uh, for uh, people with BPD to live a healthy life. We also need to focus on distressing symptoms. Depressive symptoms and dysphoria, that kind of horrible feeling of, of things not being right, uh, are incredibly unpleasant. And I'm not suggesting we don't focus on symptoms, but we need to focus on the symptoms that people themselves nominate that they want uh, treatment for. And we need to be honest if we actually don't have an effective treatment for those symptoms. And as I've you know, talked about at length, auditory verbal hallucinations are really something that I think we need to start thinking about rather than ignoring, uh, putting our fingers in our, our ears and thinking that they've gone away. And we need to improve access to, to care. We need to be providing good clinical care or structured clinical management or general psychiatric management, whatever you might want to call it. We need to be providing high quality care to people with uh, borderline personality disorder across the system. The number of people that can be seen in highly specialised services is very small compared with the prevalence of the disorder. And so we need to design our treatment systems around patients' needs rather than institutional constraints or clinicians' personal interests or theoretical orientation. Just because I'm interested in this theory of borderline personality disorder doesn't mean that everybody should get that treatment. We need to really change the priorities to patients' priorities, not clinicians' priorities. And we need to increase the variety of treatments available. I often uh, quote Jan uh, and her survey uh, that, that she did with Sharon uh, about um, uh, the, the need for variety in treatments, that patients ask for variety. This is not like Henry Ford, you know, who said you can have any colour as long as it's black. And essentially in the, uh, in the mental health system, it's really come down to, well, you can either, either have no treatment or you can have any treatment as long as it's DBT. Now, DBT is, and I certainly wouldn't want to put that down in any way, it's a very effective treatment uh, and it's a very worthy treatment, but it's not the only treatment and it doesn't suit everybody and it has its limitations. It is not a panacea and we need to be thinking more broadly and we need to